up on this Monday edition of Newsline at Noon, Korea opens a one yuan direct trading market as part of efforts to build an offshore trading hub in Seoul for the Chinese currency. Next year's budget proposal has been submitted to the National Assembly's plenary session with rival parties agreeing to discuss any changes to the draft bill before it's put to vote on Tuesday. Plus, Hong Kong shuts down its government offices after clashes between police and pro-democracy protesters surrounding government headquarters. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Monday on the first day of December here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon. Korea has taken a large step towards building an offshore trading hub in Seoul for the Chinese currency. A new market opened a few hours ago that allows for direct trading of the won and the yuan, cutting costs for bankers and traders. Kim min reports. It's a big day for the Chinese yuan in Korea. A direct trading market for the Korean won and the Chinese yuan opened Monday morning. The market, which opens at 9 a.m. and closes at 3 p.m. every weekday, is expected to drastically cut transaction costs for exchanging the two currencies. Until now, local banks would have to convert their Korean won into U.S. dollars at home and exchange them into the yuan in Hong Kong. Twelve banks, which include seven local and five foreign bank branches in Korea, will participate as market makers that propose selling and buying prices, which is aimed at pumping liquidity into the market. Korean government officials expect the market to boost efforts for developing a hub for offshore yuan transactions. Speaking at a ceremony marking the launch of the market, Korean Finance Minister Che kyung hwan said that Korea will foster the market into what he called a competitive and global hidden champion. Che added that to promote one yuan trading, the government will build an electronic trading system up to the standards of the one dollar trading market. In July, President Park Geun-hye and her Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping agreed to open the one yuan market this month. Kim min ji Arirang News. The clock is ticking at the National Assembly for lawmakers to pass next year's budget bill. Rival parties have extended the budget review period by two days, with the legal deadline for passage coming fast on Tuesday. Now, if they don't come to a compromise on the issues that divide them by then, the original budget bill that was automatically submitted to the plenary session this Monday will be passed. Shi Gil has more. Korea's two main rival parties will spend Monday reviewing the 2015 budget, having given themselves two extra days to do so, with hopes of finalizing the process before the bipartisan bill is put to a vote at Tuesday's plenary session. We decided to extend the budget review deadline in hopes of passing the budget bill tomorrow. We are also looking into passing auxiliary budget bills by Tuesday's legal deadline. If the parties manage to achieve that goal, it will mark the first time in 12 years that the parliament will have passed the budget by the legal deadline. Under a new law, if the two rival parties fail to reach a bipartisan agreement by the end of Tuesday, the government's original version of the bill will be passed automatically. The opposition party boycotted parliament last week over two plans put forth by the central government, one regarding cost sharing for a free childcare program and another for a proposed cigarette price increase. The opposition has also demanded scale backs in corporate tax reductions. We are not 100 percent satisfied, but our party is doing its best to secure budgets that will improve the livelihoods of the people and make Korea a safer place to live. While the two sides have set aside their major points of contention, they still need to reach agreement on the government's economic revitalization plan and welfare bills. The parties are also in a dispute over tax-related bills that are attached to the budget, which will be put to a vote on Tuesday with or without bipartisan agreement. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
Now, every month for nearly three years now, Korea has recorded a trade surplus. And it's a trend that continued in November as well. And the trade ministry expects a number of new records to be broken before the year is out. Kim ji reports. Despite concerns stemming from the weakening Japanese yen, Korea's trade surplus carried over a 34th straight month in November to 5.6 billion U.S. dollars. Korea's trade volume surpassed the $1 trillion mark last month, eight days sooner than last year. At its current pace, the trade ministry predicts annual exports to reach $1.1 trillion by the end of this year, with new record highs for a trade volume, export volume, and the trade surplus. Although the volume of exports increased on year by 2.5 percent in November, exports shrank on month due to fewer working days. The trade ministry says outbound shipments shrank by nearly 2 percent in November from the previous month to around $47 billion. Exports of semiconductors, steel and machinery grew on the back of growing demand from the United States, while exports related to telecommunications, automobiles and oil and petrochemical products dropped. The amount of imports fell by 4 percent on month in November to $41.4 billion due to falling oil prices. Imports of raw materials, including coal and crude oil, decreased, while capital and consumer goods, particularly fish and meat products, increased. Outbound shipments to the U.S. increased by more than 20 percent for the second straight month, with Korean exports to China dropping 3 percent during the same period. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Samsung Group has announced the ins and outs and ups and downs from its annual leadership reshuffle. No tectonic shifts this year, though, with the group's chairman Lee Gun Hee still in hospital, recovering from a heart attack. At Samsung Electronics, Yoon Bu Gun, Kwon Oh Hyun, and Shin Jong Gyun all retain their current positions as the CEOs of the company's various subdivisions. The first reshuffle overseen by the group's heir apparent Lee Jae Yong also gave no promotions to anyone from the controlling family. Kim Jae Yol, Lee Gun Hee's son-in-law, married to his second daughter, was moved to lead sports business at Jae Worldwide, cementing the couple's control over Samsung's fashion and sports sector. Officials say the reshuffle was quieter than normal, as the group's performance has been disappointing recently, adding that it's too early to elevate Lee Jae Yong to the top position while his father is still receiving treatment. And former First Lady Lee Hee Ho has postponed her scheduled visit to North Korea to at least next spring. South Korea's Yonam News reports that doctors have advised the 93 year old widow of late President Kim Dae Jung to delay her trip due to concerns about her health amid the cold weather. Both Koreas recently gave the visit the green light, but the exact timing hadn't been confirmed. There had also been concerns in South Korea that a trip in the coming days could have been used for political purposes by the North, as Pyongyang will mark the third anniversary of former leader Kim Jong Il's death in mid December. Meeting with President Park Geun Hye in October, the former First Lady expressed her wish to visit Pyongyang so she could donate hand knitted hats to North Korean children. A test run coal shipment from Russia arrived in South Korea via North Korea over the weekend, marking a significant breakthrough after years of very limited economic exchanges between the two Koreas. It's hoped the rare movement of trade could be the first step towards improved economic relations and all round friendlier ties. Our Sun Jung in reports. Some 40,000 tons of coal extracted in Siberia arrived in the country last weekend through a North Korean port. The first ever shipment is part of a trilateral project undertaken by South Korea, North Korea, and Russia to transport raw materials via the Trans Siberian Railway from Russia's Hazan to North Korea's Najin port and then to the South Korean port of Pohang. Both Pyongyang and Moscow are known to have been highly cooperative throughout the entire procedure. The South Korean delegation team, who visited Najin to inspect facilities and do some last minute checkups, say they were well received by North Korean officials. Experts say an official deal on transporting coal regularly through the route could spark a revival of other collaborative plans between the two Koreas. 
The shipment is considered all the more significant as the South cut all commercial links with the North after the sinking of a South Korean warship in 2010, leaving the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex as the only economic connection. However, due to the unstable political situation on the peninsula, there are concerns the project could run into some unexpected problems down the road. The South Korean government and the consortium members, Corail, POSCO and Hyundai Merchant Marine, are holding further consultations with Russia in a bid to lessen the possible risks. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. The leaders of China and Japan agreed last month to acknowledge their differing views about the ownership of some islands in the East China Sea, but it seems the cracks have already begun to show. China is criticizing Japan for not recognizing the existence of a territorial dispute over the islands known as Senkaku in Japan and Diaoyu in China, and has been sending ships into Japanese waters near the islands over the past week or so. On the sidelines of the APEC summit in Beijing, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe agreed to work together to prevent the situation from worsening. Watchers say the renewed tensions could jeopardize a possible trilateral summit that was suggested last month by Korean President Park geun -hye. In about 10 days' time, leaders from the ASEAN member countries will be in South Korea for a very special summit. It's being dubbed the most important diplomatic event for Korea this year and is expected to take Korea ties with ASEAN to the next level. For a look at the current state of relations between Korea and ASEAN, our Hwang Sang-hee reports. Since establishing dialogue relations in 1989, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has become one of South Korea's most important partners. Trade volume with ASEAN jumped 16-fold from some 8 billion U.S. dollars in 1989 to 135 billion dollars last year, making ASEAN Korea's second largest trade partner. The region is also the number three investment destination for Korean businesses after the United States and China. Korea invested $3.8 billion in ASEAN, accounting for over 12 percent of Korea's total overseas investment last year. Korean builders received the second most construction orders from ASEAN last year, worth more than $14 billion. Ties are not just limited to economic cooperation either. ASEAN is the top tourist destination for Koreans, with some 5 million out of the 14 million outbound Koreans heading to the bloc last year. Korea received nearly 1.6 million visitors from ASEAN countries, which was the third largest number after China and Japan. That number is expected to grow, thanks to Southeast Asia's love for Hallyu or the Korean wave. Some 330,000 people from ASEAN countries live in Korea, making up a quarter of foreign population in the country. These include workers, marriage migrants and students contributing to Korea's economic development and to its transition into a mature, multicultural society. And the Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit, set to take place in Busan on December 11th and 12th, is expected to further boost their strategic relations. Hwang sang Arirang News. Now, today, December 1st, marks World AIDS Day, a day to raise awareness about the fight against HIV and to remember people who have died from the disease. Statistics show some 35 million people around the world are HIV positive and nearly 10,000 of them, on record at least, live in Korea. In the global fight against the disease, local activists say Korea could be doing much, much more than it currently is. Connie Lee reports. The number of people with AIDS is increasing here in Korea. In 2010, 773 new cases were reported. However, in 2013, more than 1,000 new cases of HIV and AIDS have emerged, making the total number of patients currently with the virus at over 8,600. The report, released by the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, shows that 92 percent of the patients are male, with most of those infected in their 20s and 30s. HIV, which stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, attacks the body's immune system, and the later symptoms of HIV infection are referred to as AIDS, a debilitating disease that requires more attention here in the nation. 
In light of World AIDS Day on December 1st, activists took to the streets of Seoul on Sunday, urging the government for more support. I hope the government would take the forefront action to change social perception on AIDS. Activists say HIV patients are discriminated against and receive inadequate health care. They say there are only 70 facilities nationwide that specialize in HIV and AIDS, and there are no facilities that care for patients a long term. Most of HIV patients who are in need to a long-term medical care would look after their own health at home with special medical equipment, or some would stay from hospital to hospital just for a limited time. However, there are small steps being taken by the government in the fight against disease. Public health centers in Seoul offer free HIV testing. However, the results are not available until about a week after. Now Seoul is hoping to speed up the process. Starting next year, we will offer rapid HIV testing. Results will be provided within 20 minutes using just a drop of blood. With the implementation of this service, early detection will prevent the health of HIV-positive patients from deteriorating and also reducing the spread of HIV by those who pass the infection unknowingly. And once the patients are confirmed as HIV-positive, the Seoul City government plans to offer them basic medical subsidies. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Let's get a check on some of the other global headlines we're following this Monday afternoon here in Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Eunice, a pro-democracy protests have heated up once again near the heart of the financial district in Hong Kong. Now, this is an area that had been calm for weeks. You're right, Junju. Most of the police protester conflict we'd seen last week was confined to the working class district of Mong Kok across the border. But earlier on this Monday, student leader Alex Chow told reporters his group was moving in on government buildings to not be ignored. The action held tonight is to uh, generate more pressure to the government uh, because you could see that while well, the government is adopting uh, tactics to avoid uh, responding uh, people's uh, opinion on uh, the political reform. Police have cleared off Lung Wo Road now, but it was a very different picture late last night into early this morning. The student-led protest movement mobilized demonstrators to reoccupy that major admiralty thoroughfare, which had been uh, cleared rather by police more than a month ago. Demonstrators chanted, surround government headquarters, clashing with police who had pushed back with pepper spray and batons. Protesters are seeking a chief executive poll that is free Free of Beijing's influence, a challenge that China has refused to concede on. Hong Kong police said 40 protesters were arrested in the overnight run-in. Pope Francis has wrapped up his three-day visit to Turkey, where he made pleas for religious tolerance and an end to violence in the region. He took a decidedly different tone against Islamic State militants, saying that they are committing a grave sin against God. Pak Chiwon tells us more. Wrapping up a three-day visit to Turkey, Pope Francis told reporters on the plane ride home that terrorist acts shouldn't stigmatize the mostly peaceful Muslim population and that equating Islam to terrorism was wrong. Many Islamic people are offended. Many, many say, no, we are not this. The Quran is a book of peace. It is a prophetic book of peace. Terrorism is not Islam. However, Pope Francis had strong words for those who are carrying out heinous acts in the name of Islam. It's a message that is especially relevant in Turkey, a country that harbors nearly two million refugees from Syria, some of whom have fled as the Islamic State has expanded its reign of terror. Taking away the peace of a people, committing every act of violence, or consenting to such acts, especially when directed against the weakest and defenseless, is a profoundly grave sin against God, since it means showing contempt for the image of God, which is in man. The comment came amid a joint service held with Patriarch Bartholomew the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church, which split from the Roman Catholic Church more than a thousand years ago.
Both leaders issued a joint declaration in Istanbul, calling on Muslims and Christians to work together for peaceful coexistence. Pope Francis also prayed with a senior Islamic cleric in Istanbul's signature Blue Mosque, which dates back to the early 15th century. Park ji Arirang News. And finally, voters in Switzerland have overwhelmingly rejected a proposal to curb the flow of immigrants into the country. 74 percent of the voters voted no in Sunday's referendum, blocking a plan that would have cut the country's net immigration to no more than 0.2 percent of the Swiss population and would require the government to reduce immigrants by up to 16,000 people per year. About 23 percent of Swiss residents are foreign nationals, mostly from EU countries. Supporters of the measure had said the move would help preserve the country's resources in a nation that saw its population grow by over a million in the past two decades. Those against the move said it would simply be bad for the economy. Solar power is the biggest and fastest growing sector in the renewable energy market as it is an affordable and feasible alternative to fossil fuels. It certainly is, and Korea is making increasing use of this abundant and free energy source. But is it going to be a global player in the market for this week's industry insight? Here's our Song ji -sun. This is the biggest solar power plant in the capital that started operating this summer. It's equivalent to 13 football fields with a capacity of 5.6 megawatts, enough for 2,200 households a year. This solar panel system has been set up on the roof of this water filtering plant, and we have completed a couple of other solar power facilities like this for the Seoul Metropolitan Government. It's fully operational even on cloudy days, and only takes three months to install and operate. The market for these solar facilities is booming in Korea accounting for 98 percent of all renewable power plants built in the first half this year. Over the past decade, solar energy has emerged as the world's biggest source of renewable energy, overtaking wind power. Last year alone, it created half of total electricity generated from renewable energy sources. The solar energy market is forecast to expand by 10 percent each year by 2030, with China and India likely accounting for half of the global demand. By then, the cost of generating electricity from solar power is expected to reach similar levels to burning fossil fuel, meaning it could become more widespread without the support of government subsidies, as it mostly depends on that at the moment. The biggest competition in the industry comes from China, which produces 80 percent of the global demand at prices 20 to 30 percent cheaper than Korea. Backed by government support, Chinese companies have been producing well over the market demand with half of the world's top 10 solar panel producers based in China. It's not easy to counter them in terms of price, so Korean firms must improve their cost efficiency, at the same time revving up quality and technology. Around 40 players are in Korea's solar power generating market, with small and mid-sized companies focusing on solar cells or modules, while large conglomerates aim to tackle the global market by equipping a complete chain of production and after-sales service. We've established a value chain from solar component production to system maintenance, and we aim to expand the solar power generation infrastructure to even include households. Industry experts point out that it's crucial that the government take steps to speed up the growth of domestic solar power market. To expand the economy scale and improve profitability, the government must ease regulations concerning installation. They also point out the government must provide financial aid to companies seeking projects overseas to help them win more share of the world's non-fossil fuel energy market. Song ji -sun, Arirang News.
Well, what a dramatic change in weather in just one day. Seems like winter is in full swing already. Uh, it's cold and snowy day here in Seoul, though on and off heavy snowfall seems to be letting up in the capital areas, whereas certain provinces like Cholado provinces will see up to 10 centimeters into tomorrow. And the single digit temperatures feel like they are sub zero due to incoming cold front and strong gusty winds, so there will be no big difference or any changes in our numbers today as the low and high will remain at 3 in Seoul while Daegu and Gwangju will peak at 7 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will be getting up to 9 while Daegu and Tukdo see highs of 4 and 5. Now I need to inform you that today is actually the mildest day of the week because tomorrow temperatures will plummet to minus 7 here in Seoul and as we can see the lows will stay on the freezing side and even highs will remain on the cold side so please be stay warm. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Let's send it back to Mark and Jinju in the studio. Okay, thank you very much for the weather as always, John. And those are the stories we're following on this Monday afternoon. Mark and I'll be back at the same time on Tuesday. Thank you for watching. Thank <music> you.